It was in the interest of both us and the Syrians, and it would reduce the Palestinians' scope for haggling. An agreement with Syria will make a positive strategic difference to Israel. An agreement with the Palestinians would just be public relations. Since the Six-Day War in 1967, Israel had occupied a strategic corner of Syria, the Golan Heights, overlooking northern Israel. Successive Israeli leaders had refused to withdraw without peace. We knew that Syria would not make a deal with Israel, would not make peace with Israel for less than full withdrawal. And, of course, for any Israeli prime minister, for Rabin in particular, to, to make the decision to go for full withdrawal was agonizing, was uh, wrenching. But before making the decision, that prime minister had to know what was being given in return, what the Syrian package consisted of. At this moment, a new American secretary of state came to Jerusalem. We were trying to give some propulsion, some momentum to the uh, uh, track uh, involving the Syrians. Christopher came to meet with Rabin. The four of us came into the room and sat clustered around, uh, in, around the small table. And uh, after some give and take, Rabin suddenly uh, surprised us all with, uh, with a very dramatic gambit. He uh, did give me a very important uh, message to take to uh, uh, Syria, to take to uh, President Assad, and that was, he said, ask Assad if I am able to uh, give him what he needs, will he really go all out for peace? In other words, if Rabin withdrew from the Golan Heights, would President Assad accept alternative ways to safeguard Israel's border? Would Syria agree to full peace stop support of terrorism from Lebanon, and establish diplomatic and trade relations with Israel. Christopher left the room uh, with the knowledge that uh, I think he, he was holding a, a very significant mandate in his pocket. When he arrived in Damascus, Christopher presented Israel's offer of withdrawal to President Assad. His mistrust of the Israelis was such that he always took every concept and turned it over and looked at it from all different sides. And that's what he was doing with the concept of withdrawal. And he did it by asking me questions, not impolite questions, but very aggressive questions. Now, you have to tell me, uh, Mr. Christopher, what the prime minister means by withdrawal. That's just an empty term. I really know, know what it means. Christopher then shuttled back to Jerusalem. I met with the uh, uh, prime minister again. He was disappointed that uh, uh, Assad had not been more forthcoming, had not shown more appreciation for Rabin's willingness to consider full withdrawal. On almost every detail, uh, there was uh, an essentially negative answer or uh, an answer that suggested that a very protracted process of bargaining would, would have to, uh, to begin. Rabin could not wait for President Assad. He had promised his voters a peace agreement within a year. So he now settled for the deal that was available with the PLO in Oslo. But premature disclosure could ditch the deal, and the media were getting close to the story. Is the stage being set for a meeting between yourself and the PLO leadership, perhaps even with Arafat himself? Not in the foreseeable future. Before the next election, at least? I hope not. Rabin had to act fast. He gave the go-ahead to Foreign Minister Shimon Peres. Shimon Peres told me, Yoel, take all your documents, come with me. We're going to conclude the agreement. Paris set off for Scandinavia. To clinch the deal, he needed a smokescreen. He met Norwegian Foreign Minister Johan Holst secretly in Stockholm and asked him to be his mouthpiece in case anyone was listening in as they telephoned Arafat in Tunis. 
uh, I called um, Arafat and I got him immediately on the, on the line. And I, to I told him that um, in the code we used at the time, uh, Abu Ammar, which is uh, Arafat's nom de guerre, um, I have uh, the two uh, fathers here, that was the code for foreign ministers, my father and the other father, and he immediately understood what I meant. And I said, and they want to finish everything tonight. We went through the last disputed points, one by one. The phone's loudspeaker was turned on, so all of us could hear Holst on the other end. I was listening in for perhaps four or five hours. At around midnight, Shimon Peres went to sleep, and he told me, if you need my approval, if you want to go beyond the general instructions that we have agreed on with Rabin back at home, wake me up. At issue were the withdrawal of Israel's military government and how and when they would deal with difficult issues like Jerusalem. Twice, I had to wake Shimon Peres up. The second and last time he woke Peres up was over the issue of who would control the bridges between the West Bank and Jordan. We wanted to be able to control people entering and exiting from the autonomous areas to see that they are not uh, you know, concealing weapons and, and, and the like. We wanted the crossing points to be under our control. I said to Holst, tell him we will not retreat from our positions. Tell them if we don't settle it tonight, it might never get settled. We agreed that the crossing points be jointly controlled. It was five o'clock in the morning. After seven hours on the telephone, they finally had an agreement. I think the phone bill was paid by the Swedish government. We still owe them the money. President Clinton agreed to host a signing ceremony. Then, with everyone gathering in Washington and on their way to the White House, Yasser Arafat noticed something missing from the document, the name PLO. He said, I cannot sign this document. I'm the chairman of the PLO, not the head of the Palestinian delegation. And Israel has recognized the PLO. So what are the Israelis up to? Sort it out. Ahmed Tibi rang me. He said, there's a small matter to be sorted out. If it isn't sorted out, the ceremony is off and the chairman is going home. I saw Arafat ordering the plane to be, to, to be ready to leave Washington if they don't accept the PLO. I said, listen, all the documents are printed and ready. It's just an hour before the signing. Less than half an hour before the signing ceremony, Peres called Arafat's representative to his hotel. He suggested that the phrase, the PLO team, be added to the document. I said, I'll ring Arafat. I said to Arafat, Perez says, how about the PLO team? Arafat said, in all of the text? I said, in all the text. He said, okay, two kisses, one for you and one for Perez. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Arafat, chairman of the executive council of the Palestine Liberation Organization, his Excellency Yitzhak Rabin, Prime Minister of Israel, the President of the United States. The moment I saw Arafat walking out from the White House <laughs> with Rabin next to him and Clinton and so on, 